Right, here I'm looking at the green cylinder and the blue cylinder. You'll notice the green one is hollow and the blue one is a solid cylinder. Uh, they've both got the same mass and the same radius, okay? My question to you is, which one will win the race? Alright, so have a think, which one do you think is going to win the race? Right, so here we go. And you can see the blue one gets down much quicker than the green one. The solid one much faster than the hollow one. When I first, when I first th saw that, I thought, eh? They've both got the same mass and they've both the same radius. How's the blue one faster, like? And uh, I thought, hey, what I'll do, I'll derive the equation for the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder and compare it with a formula for uh, the, the equation for a hollow cylinder and see what's going on there. Yeah, it's totally mental, man. So that's what I'm going to take you through here now, all right? A uh, moment of inertia, I like to think of that as rotational mass. It's how hard it is to stop something spinning or, conversely, how hard it is to start something spinning. Uh, to do this, we need a little bit of calculus. Uh, so, let's get going then. I started off by drawing a cylinder of height L. And... Uh, there's the axis of rotation, look, through the middle of the cylinder to keep things simple. I then defined density as mass divided by volume. Density, we use the Greek letter rho, is m over pi r squared l. Pi r squared l is the volume of a cylinder. So everything's nice and simple there. Now with calculus, it's like adding up loads of different, loads of little bits, adding them all up together. So what I'm going to do with a cylinder is take the differential of mass for concentric rings of a cylinder. So I'm going to take tiny slices of concentric rings of the cylinder and basically add them all up, right, uh, to get the final formula that I need. Uh, but first I need to find the differential of mass to get an equation set up nicely to begin. So... From the top one there, density equals mass over volume. Well, mass must equal density times volume. And to get the volume of each slice, I've taken each ring of cylinder and I've flattened it out. Now, obviously, the circumference of the cylinder will be pi d or 2 pi r. That's along the top. The height of it's still L. So there's my area. It's cut, it would, if I rolled it out, it would like turn into a rectangle. And then I would need to give it a tiny thickness, what I'll, I'll call that a small change in R. Right, so it's got a length, a height, and a small change in R. There's a volume. So that's 2 pi R L times the small change in uh, thickness. That's the volume times the density rho gives me my mass, right? I can call that dm, the small change in mass for a small change in uh, the thickness of this ring, cylinder ring, all right? So we've got density times volume here equals the small change in mass. Now I can go to my formula for moment of inertia. I'm not gonna derive it here, I'm just gonna state what it is. It's the sum if I, if I took each tiny segment of the cylinder and added them all up, that's what this means. The sigma sign means add everything up. So I get my mass of that point times the radius of that point squared, multiply together, add up all the points within the solid cylinder, and I can rewrite that as an integral of r squared with respect to the mass. Right? Uh, so that's great. Now what I need to do now is put swap dm for this lot of stuff and uh, integrate the thing. So let's go down then. Oh, of course my limits for my rings of cylinder are going to go from zero to the radius of the whole cylinder. All right, it adds up a what we call an infinite sequence of radii. Radii? Radii? Uh, so I'll go ahead and integrate this, and I've got an r squared there and an r there. That's going to be r cubed. The 2, the pi, the l, and the rho are constants, so that can all come to the left, you know, come out of the integral. 
like I've done here and I end up with 2 pi L rho outside of the integral and I end up with R cubed uh, integrating R cubed with respect to R with the limit so I equals 0 to the big capital R uh, come down there a bit then I've got you integrate R cubed you get R to the power 4 divided by 4 the constant stays outside and I've got to put my limits in and when R is 0, 0 to the 4 is 0, so the, the second part goes to 0. So I can just substitute the little r for the big r. Right? I don't need to subtract that lower limit there, because it just would be nothing anyway. And something minus nothing is naught. Uh, so my formula comes to this. 2 pi rho L r to the power 4, you know, the radius of the whole cylinder, to the power 4 divided by 4. Now, I can still do a bit of jiggery-pokery here, because rho, at the top, I said, well, rho equals all this stuff. So, let's swap that in. Let's swap rho for all that stuff up there. And if I do that, I get all this. Right? And a lot of that cancels out. And I end up with that. That's the formula for the moment of inertia for a solid cylinder. A half times the mass of the cylinder times the radius of the cylinder squared. All right, interesting. Now, I'm not gonna derive this, but if, if I've got just a shell, the moment of inertia, or the rotational mass, say, of a cylindrical shell, is just mR squared. So you'll notice, the moment of inertia for a shell is bigger than it is for a solid. Now, if you come back up to this equation, you can see how far away the matter is from this uh, axis of rotation, r squared, has a lot more effect than the mass, right? So where the stuff is, where the mass is, affects the moment of inertia much more than how heavy it is. So that's a key thing. And if you think of a shell, all the mass is on the outside. There's nothing in the middle. And that's going to have a much greater impact than with a solid, where a lot of the mass is nearer the centre of rotation. You know, the axis of rotation. So anyway, there's my two formulas. Uh, and when I get angular acceleration equals torque over the moment of inertia, right? Now, for a solid, the moment of inertia is going to be small. The torque might be the same. So for the same torque, when that's small, my acceleration is going to be big, which means I go faster. Conversely, when, when the, the shell has a bigger moment of inertia. So this number here is bigger. So for the same torque, a bigger moment of inertia, I get a smaller angular acceleration, which means it goes slower. So that's why the solid goes faster than the shell. And that's it, quite an interesting conclusion.